Now the program is going to feature a number of videos interspersed with uh, talks from various members of the governing body. I don't know what they're going to talk about, but they certainly have chosen some interesting themes. I'm going to be on the edge of my seat to see what they have to tell us. But first up is a video on one of our favorite subjects, Caleb and Sophia. Now just so you know, Caleb is not a member of the governing body, but <laughs> he's, he's going to be on the program anyway. Now this is the longer version. They call it the epic version. It's part of the series uh, Become Jehovah's Friend. And the title is, Who Should Be My Friend? Let's watch. You got this, come on. Go, go, go. Yes. Bro, that was good. So we're only 50 seconds into the latest installment in the Caleb and Sophia saga, this being lesson 47, Who Should Be My Friend? 50 seconds in, and I'm already triggered as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, as someone who grew up in the Jehovah's Witness religion, I've repeatedly commented on the fact that when you're a Jehovah's Witness child, school somehow isn't just for learning. It's not just about going to school and receiving an education. You go to school at least partly with the objective of recruiting your classmates. We don't see that in the opening 50 seconds, but what we do see, maybe Tibor can overlay if he's feeling gracious, we do see Sophia in the playground reading a Jehovah's Witness publication while her friends around her are playing. So if you're watching this, as a Jehovah's Witness child, the message you're getting is, oh, I need to be reading Jehovah's Witness publications when I'm at school, when people around me are playing. I can't just enjoy myself with my school friends. I can't just use the break period to have a break from learning to just relax and unwind and laugh and play, I've got to somehow use this time to indoctrinate myself using Jehovah's Witness publications. That's the message you're getting as a child. That's the message parents are getting so that they'll be making sure children go to school with JW publications in their book bag to read during lunch break or whenever. I'm also curious as to this scene where Sophia is alone on the school bus and noticing her friends being picked up rather than being required to take the school bus. Maybe Tibor can again overlay. That's a bit of an odd scene. I don't quite understand what's being depicted here. Is this suggesting that if you're a good Jehovah's Witness, you'll take the school bus rather than be picked up? It's almost suggesting that it would be molly coddling or being overly indulgent of children if they were to be picked up by their parents. It's almost suggesting that children should be put to work, which has been the message in the past. Thumbnail here, 
to a talk by David Splain on the need for child labour. <laughs> the governing body just seems to think that children should be putting in a shift, whether it's participating in chores around the house, cleaning, whatever, or making sure that they are keeping on top of their studying and preparation for the meetings. I don't know, for me, in just the opening 50 seconds of this latest Caleb and Sophia cartoon, there's a distinct anti-children message that is harmonious with the overall tone of the governing body whenever they seem to talk about children especially the likes of Stephen Lett and David Splain, they seem to genuinely believe that most children have it too easy. And for me, that's what we're seeing depicted here. We see throughout the gospel accounts that those who chose to befriend Jesus gained the best friend possible. Hey there. Oh. Oh, you like to draw? I like your notes. Really cool. Mom taught me. Pictures help me remember. Me too. So, looks like we have a talk together. Yeah. I'll get in touch to practice soon. Lydia, we're leaving. Well, I gotta go. See you later, Sophia. Hey, bro. Hey, good to see you. I'm glad I was on your team. My favorite thing was the safari tree house. Yeah, it had all the cool jungle animals on the wall. Timmy, I didn't think your team was going to make it. I love my prize. You got a prize? We all did. <laughs> Okay, kids, settle down. Time to get started. We have a lot to talk about today. Before we begin, for those of you that participated in the science club this weekend, we will be having another camping trip. But only the ones with the highest score on the math project will be selected to go. More on that after class. Hey, now today Sophia, we, we need you in our club. You're good at science. We have another trip coming up. Hey, Sophia, come with us. So anyway, all the kids had badges and prizes and stuff. And it sounded like a lot of fun. And it seems like they really need my help. Hmm, I see. Oh, you see what's wrong with the car? No, I wish. No, I see why you want to be in the club. You do? Of course. We all want to have friends and do fun things. Please, would you mind moving the light over here? Uh, right there. Thank you. I just wish I had some kid friends. Well, they really don't like kids doing science, do they? <laughs> this is the overwhelming message I'm picking up here. And they're doing it very subtly. They're not overtly suggesting that science is a bad thing, but the way the science club is being promoted in such a way that Sophia feels excluded, the way there's this branding with the badge with the atom and toys being given out that Sophia can't have because she's not part of the club, for me, it's almost trying to paint science in a negative light so that young Jehovah's Witness children 
will view it as undesirable in some way or something that they either can't aspire to or shouldn't aspire to. But really, what is science? Science is what's given us the internet, JW Broadcasting, computers, JW Library, all of the benefits of modern technology and modern living derive from science. And yet for me, young Jehovah's Witnesses here are being taught to think of science as something that is somehow beyond their reach or should be at least treated with a bit of caution. Then you have this scene where Sophia is confiding in her father when they're fixing the car. And ultimately the problem seems to be that Sophia doesn't have enough friends. Again, as someone raised in the Jehovah's Witness religion, this is entirely relatable. And it's not a good thing. It's not something that Jehovah's Witnesses should take pride in. The fact that their children are forced into a situation where they cannot cultivate friendships. Because if you think about it, they're going to school, looking at all of their school friends, thinking if Armageddon were to come tomorrow, these would all die. So even if I were allowed to have them as friends, which I'm not, would I really want to get close to somebody who's going to die soon? That's the mentality you have as a young Jehovah's Witness or as the child of Jehovah's Witnesses. And we can see the frustration being portrayed here in the form of Sophia. I just wish I had some kid friends. Mm. Jehovah wants you and me to have friends. But the question you need to ask yourself is, who should be my friend? Let's talk about it at our next family worship. How about you go do some research on Martha? And I will tell Caleb too. And then we can come back together and talk about it as a family. Sophia, are you ready? Yeah. Martha, a Jewess, the sister of Lazarus, and Mary. They lived in Bethany. A village about two miles away from Jerusalem. Which was probably Jesus' home base when he came down from Galilee. Martha liked to cook. <laughs> yes, she did. And she would cook for Jesus and all his disciples when they would visit. Wow, that would have been a lot of food. Yes, and a lot of work. But if they worked together, they'd make it a success. However, some of their friends felt differently about Jesus. Martha makes the best apricot cakes. It's just a fact. <laughs> You've always praised me too much, Talia. Well, if it gets me more apricot cakes, I will continue to praise you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Talia, did you hear? The teacher Jesus, he's coming back to visit. The man from Galilee? Are you, are you hosting him again? Yes, I am. Actually, it's tonight. I've heard a lot of talk. The Pharisees in Jerusalem, they don't approve of that man. I am not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. Okay, well, I guess I better be getting home. See you two later. Jesus is here. Yay! Car 
cartoon Jesus is here. <laughs> Let's get the party started. This is just weird for me. I grew up in a religion where this sort of thing would have been considered deeply disrespectful. Whenever Jesus was depicted in the publications or the videos, they always tried to do it as respectfully as possible and in a way that dignified Jesus and made him look very, I don't know, they made him look like a perfect man, which obviously Jehovah's Witnesses believe he was a perfect man. And so to have him rendered in cartoon form with these odd kind of body dimensions and that kind of thing, it's just, it wouldn't have sat right with me when I was a believing Jehovah's Witness. And I'm sure many who are Jehovah's Witnesses now, especially those of my generation and older, will just have something niggling at the back of their head. Should we really be doing this? <laughs> I know it's not the first time they've done a cartoon Jesus, by the way. We have seen cartoon Jesus appear in previous installments of Caleb and Sophia. But it doesn't sit right with me. It really doesn't. Even though I don't actually consider myself a Christian anymore. It, uh, it riles me, shall we say. What I do like, though, about this reimagining of the Mary and Martha story is this line. I've heard a lot of talk. The Pharisees in Jerusalem, they don't approve of that man. I am not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. The Pharisees in Jerusalem don't approve of that man. I'm not sure it's such a good idea for you to be known as his friend. Isn't that the sort of language that Jehovah's Witnesses use when it comes to apostates? The governing body don't approve of such talk. I'm not sure it's such a good idea for you to hang around with someone who's murmuring against the organization. <laughs> Isn't that exactly the attitude that's encouraged inside Jehovah's Witnesses? There is no room, is there, for having or expressing an opinion that's different to those of the leaders. The Pharisees, if you think about it, the governing body. You could have Jesus walk into a kingdom hall and announce himself as Jesus and start teaching and sharing his ideas and he would probably get dragged out as an apostate. Let's be fair. That's the reality of the organization we have today. So I couldn't help but see more than a bit of irony in this particular scene. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Let me get this straight. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men? The teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. That's valuable. That's you, Martha. Don't let this Jesus ruin you with his ideas. So 
so kind of you. How is he doing? Not well. I sent word to Jesus. He will help my brother. You sent word to Jesus? Have you still not heard? He's angering people with his shocking speech. He's claiming to be God's son. He's crazy. He's he loyal to Jehovah, and he is our friend. Sadly, Lazarus died. But do you remember what happened next? Jesus came back to Bethany and resurrected Lazarus. Jesus was a real friend. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And he showed them what kind of friend Jehovah can be to us. But that's not where the story ends. Do you know what some people did after that? Many of the Jews who saw what he did put faith in him. But some of them went off to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done? Why did they do that? Because not even seeing Jesus bring someone back to life was enough to convince them that he was the Christ. Okay, there are a couple of things I want to talk about here. The first being a scene which seems to portray Jesus as being progressive when it comes to the role of women in society. He wanted you and Mary to sit and learn about God just like the men? A teacher instructing women, a woman's job is to provide food for her household. That's true. A good woman prepares herself for hard work. What's happening here, I think, is actually quite subtle and clever. Ultimately, it amounts to managing expectations of women in the Jehovah's Witness organization. So imagine three levels. The top level being parity with men, where you get to teach. The middle level or second level being being able to be taught by men. And the bottom level or level one being you're just there to provide food if you're a woman. So imagine these three levels. And really all women should be on level three. There's no reason, is there, why women shouldn't be just as involved in teaching as men are. We should be seeing way more of women when it comes to all walks of life, including matters of belief and religion and that sort of thing. But Jehovah's Witnesses clearly don't believe that. They subscribe to the view of Paul who said, let the women be silent in the congregation. And what they're doing here is they are trying to reframe the Mary and Martha story as told in Luke chapter 10 as being an example of Jesus being progressive and giving more empowerment to women. But what actually happened in the conversation that's just skimmed past, we don't even hear the words of Jesus. Well, if Tibor is gracious, we can look up Luke chapter 10 and read verses 40 to 42. Martha, on the other hand, was distracted with attending to many duties. So she came to him and said, Lord, does it not matter to you that my sister has left me alone to attend to things? Tell her to come and help me. In answer, the Lord said to her, I'll help you what needs doing. <laughs> that would have been impressive. if he. Imagine if he had said that. I would be thinking, okay, this is someone who understands that it's not the role of women to be handmaids, to be servants, to be essentially treated like cattle or robots in a household setting. Here's someone who's willing to muck in. Oh, but Lord, 
you have many wise things to tell us and you need to be thinking about those important things rather than the mundane preparation of food and catering and that sort of thing. Oh, don't worry, as it happens, I am the world's greatest teacher. So I'm sure I can find a workaround. I'm sure I can either do a recap in the morning or give my talk in such a way that I can condense things and make things even more easily understood. I can do both. I can help you and I can be a teacher. <laughs> that conversation didn't happen. Instead, if we go back to the Bible, it says in verse 41, In answer the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and disturbed about many things. A few things, though, are needed, or just one. For her part, Mary chose the good portion, and it will not be taken away from her. A few things are needed, and you're going to fulfill them because you're a woman. Is essentially what he's saying. And yet, in the Caleb and Sophia cartoon, they don't even show this conversation they just frame the whole episode as being, again, all about empowering women, as having the right to be taught. <laughs> Not being teachers, but simply having a right to be taught by men. Again, for me, this is managing the expectations of women. It's keeping them in their place and effectively saying you should be grateful just to be taught by men. At least we're not chaining you to the kitchen as used to be the case in the Jewish culture. So that got on my nerves. And then we have the whole crazy Lazarus coming back from the dead story. Jesus came back to Bethany and resurrected Lazarus. Jesus was a real friend. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He cared about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He cared about Lazarus in particular, so that Lazarus got to cheat death. Why isn't he caring now about all of the millions who are dying? Nine million children dying every year before they can reach the age of five, people dying in all sorts of traumatic situations, people dying from war, people dying from pestilence. Why isn't Jesus caring about that? Why, why is he just caring about this dude called Lazarus? And regarding the Lazarus story, it's not really something I used to think about as a Jehovah's Witness or indeed as someone who considered himself a Christian. But it's worth noting that the whole Lazarus resurrection narrative only appears in the Gospel of John. So you have Matthew, no mention of Lazarus, being resurrected after four days. Mark, oh, I think we can skip that story. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. Luke, yeah, yeah, I, I gave that one a pass. Um, <laughs> didn't really find that relevant. Only John, out of all of the gospel writers, thinks it's worthwhile to include a story where a man gets wrapped in cloth and put in a cave, having died and left there for four days in hot conditions, and his body is reanimated. I, I'm sorry, if this really happened, what on earth were the writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke doing? Why did they omit this? This is a big deal. And why don't we hear more from Lazarus? about his experience? Why isn't there a gospel of Lazarus? Why isn't there a letter of Lazarus sharing his experience as someone who was dead for four days but came back? 
I'm sorry, but this is just one of many examples of the gospel writers clearly just making things up. They seemed like Martha's friends, but they hated Jesus. How do you think Martha dealt with her unbelieving friends? Jesus is the Christ, the resurrection and the life. He is the Son of God, and he is my friend. Talia, you've been kind to me in the past, but you don't believe Jesus' teachings. We cannot be friends. Martha stuck with Jesus and his friends. They helped her become Jehovah's friend. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend, I am not going to join the club. That's my girl. We are so proud of you, Sophia. And Jehovah is proud of you, too. Now, how about you go finish up your homework? Mom tells me we have a guest coming over. Okay. Jehovah, please help me find a good friend. Someone who loves you. At least you are my friend. Sophia! Lydia is here. Our talk! <laughs> you like turtles? I love turtles. Really? I've got something I want to show you. He is so cute! You know, Sophia, I think we're going to be friends. Yep, definitely friends. Admit it. You enjoy watching Caleb and Sophia just as much as the kids do. <laughs> and we know that because we get letters. Oh, I know you get letters, David. I also know that you're extremely selective in which letters you take seriously. We might mention that we've had just a few parents write in expressing concern that some of our videos depict scenes that could have an effect on children who've been protected from anything even hinting at an act of violence. We very much appreciate the concern. However, when portraying a Bible account, we cannot ignore the message Jehovah saw fit to preserve in His Word. We don't feel comfortable watering down the inspired insight that Jehovah has preserved for the benefit of true worshipers. So when it's a letter praising the governing body for their Caleb and Sophia videos, when it's a letter telling the governing body that they've done a splendid job and that the Caleb and Sophia videos are enjoyed even by adults, those are letters that they can take seriously. Those are letters that give them knowledge about their audience. But if it's a letter from a parent complaining about violence and gore in convention dramatizations, then, well, 
We think we know better, actually, than the parents. That's the message I'm getting. And no, I'm sorry, David Splain. I do not enjoy the Caleb and Sophia cartoons. This one is a perfect example of the manipulation. I mean, just think about it. It's one thing to manipulate adults, as we see in, for example, the Jade and Nita dramatizations. You know, using all the tools that cults commonly use to control people's thinking and behavior and emotions, wielding those dark arts on adults is one thing. But when you start manipulating kids, doesn't that say something about how low you're willing to sink? If it's for the furtherance of your organization and your power, you're willing to do that. I think that's another level of evil. And for me, what we saw in the concluding few minutes of the Caleb and Sophia cartoon was just a blatant call to shun those who don't support the Jehovah's Witness belief system. Talia, you've been kind to me in the past, but you don't believe Jesus' teachings. We cannot be friends. If you don't believe Jesus' teachings as interpreted for you by the governing body, then I'm sorry, you're not friend material. And what's interesting is, this is an entirely made-up conversation. This conversation never took place. This Talia is an invented character. If you actually go to the account of Lazarus in John chapter 11... Well, I actually won't read it because, you know, I don't, I don't need to read it to make the point that <laughs> this isn't in there. But if you want to check, it's John chapter 11, verses 43 through 47, where it describes Lazarus rising from the dead after four days. And then it describes some having faith in Jesus due to witnessing the resurrection but some going off to the Pharisees to tell them about what Jesus had done. That's the story. And from that simple passage in John chapter 11, they've spun it out to include this character called Talia, who was complaining about Jesus or essentially bitching about Jesus and who therefore was unworthy of being a friend. If the Bible is truly the word of God, why can't they just use the Bible? Why do they have to make up characters and make up conversations and add them to the Bible? Why is that necessary? What you're effectively saying is the Bible's not enough. We could do with a few more stories that aren't in the Bible. So on the subject of shunning and how important it is to shun, we're going to make up a story that's a spin-off from the Lazarus Mary Martha story. That's what they've said here. And it's similar to the whole thing with doctored verses in the New World Translation. Thumbnail here to the first part of that series, or the series in which I cover these verses, if Tibor is gracious. What does it say about your underlying respect for the Bible as God's word if you treat it with such disdain as to not only change the Bible to suit your ideas or in places where the Bible says something awkward, but you also add to the Bible stories or conversations that never happened. 
for me, there's an underlying problem with an organization claiming to be all about the Bible, but treating it so casually as something that can just be changed as they see fit. And then you have Sophia giving the application of this made-up Talia story. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend, I am not going to join the club. That's my girl. We are so proud of you, Sophia. Wow. How repulsive. Not only is Sophia learning from a made-up story that isn't even in the Bible, that she can only be friends with people who help her be friends with Jehovah, in other words, other Jehovah's Witnesses. Not only is she learning that her opportunities to have any kind of social network are limited strictly to members of a certain religious movement, but she's also learning that it would be bad or wrong for her to join a science club. Which, I mean, you can be part of a science club without it being a mandatory requirement for you to be friends with everyone within that club. What, honestly, does the, the science club have to do with this whole idea of friendship and who should or shouldn't be your friend? It's profoundly dark and coercive, isn't it? It's not just about the shunning. It's not just about guilting Jehovah's Witness children who happen to have friends who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, there's also a subplot of anti-science. Because it has to be a science club that's involved here, doesn't it? Science is the issue. They don't want, it seems, Jehovah's Witness children either having friends who aren't other Jehovah's Witnesses or being enthusiastic students of science. 